camera has been working very well lately. So I just want to check that it is recording. Uh, for, for you, uh, for in the afternoon it worked well, but in, in the morning it wasn't working well. So I'll, I'll come back every so often. So, okay, guys, uh, last time on Tuesday, we finished talking about thermoelasticity. Uh, thermoelasticity is an extension of elasticity that considers uh, changes of volume uh, as strains that can impact on stresses. And that goes into the constitutive equation of the material. Notice that everything else is the same. Equilibrium is the same. Kinematic equations are the same. The only thing that changes is the constitutive equation in which we have a new variable, which is temperature, that is solved together with the stresses and strains uh, with this other coupled uh, equation. So if you were to uh, add the variation of temperature, in problems related to reservoir geomechanics, then these are the questions that you have to do to solve. And in addition, if you want to add a pore pressure to that, uh, you're going to have now a constitutive equation that links elast elastic parameters to strains, pore elastic parameters to pore pressure, and the thermoelastic parameters so thermoelastic parameters to change the temperature. Uh, as long as you do that, uh, you can solve uh, a problem of thermoelasticity. So uh, there are several uh, properties of rocks that are not well captured by linear elasticity. One of those, as I, we just uh, saw before, is uh, one is poro elasticity. If you have a porous medium, it's not going to be the same. And if you have variation of temperatures, uh, also uh, linear elasticity is not going to be enough to solve your problem. And I'd like to go very briefly uh, into discussing viscoelasticity now. In, in viscoelasticity, we have deformations and stresses that are time dependent. And in rocks, uh, many times you have uh, viscoelastic uh, properties. There are going to be uh, three fundamental types of manifestations of viscoelasticity uh, that are kind of easy to, to see it and to conceptualize. But basically, you know, all are going to be part of the same, uh, which is uh, time-dependent deformation. Before we we're going to those three. Uh, do you know any examples of very viscous rocks? It depends on the time scale, very well. Yeah, at, at in the long time scale, almost every type of rock is going to be, uh, is going to exhibit some viscoelasticity. Uh, yes, John. It, okay, well then, before we go to the examples, then let's try to define what, what is a, a viscoelastic solid. Uh, a viscoelastic solid, you can subject it to a given stress, and as we subject it to stress, we know this is going to deform, right? So, if here, we increase the stress, we expect to see some linear relationship. Uh, we can set that as a function of time, and we will expect to see also a linear relationship with strain, right? But in some of these uh, viscoelastic materials, you can hold the stress after that point and keep it constant, and a viscoelastic solid, contrary to what you would expect, that strain is just going to stay there and not move anymore, it's going to continue displaying strains as a function of time. 
which are going to tend towards an asymptotic value. That type of strain has a name, uh, a time-dependent strain at the constant stress is something called creep. It's called a creep strain. So any kind of rocks that develops this uh, sort of time-dependent strain at a constant stress uh, is going to be viscoelastic. That is just uh, one of the possible manifestations of viscoelasticity in a rock. And for example, uh, a, a case of a very a viscoelastic rock uh, is salt rocks. Uh, salt rocks, um, they, they can have in the grains a more or less well-defined crystalline structure, but they are also composed by grains. And those grains, they tend to slide relatively to each other and as soon as you put some stress, they will start to deform as a function of time. They can bear some uh, shear stress, but not for a long time. So for example, uh, the, if you were to drill a wellbore uh, through a viscous uh, rock, salt rock, and at time t, this is the size of the wellbore, uh, as you're drilling, if you're not too fast in drilling that wellbore, after a couple of hours, you may find that your hole is now smaller because of this type of viscous deformation. You're drilling the wellbore, you add a lot of stress around the walls of the wellbore, and that stress is making the rock uh, mobilize and deform uh, because of creep strains. So in this case, this happens uh, very often with a salt rock. So this is manifestation number one of uh, viscoelasticity, a creep strain. Number two is, is very similar, but uh, now, now we're going to change something. Uh, we're going to get a piece of a porous solid, compress it, and then fix the deformation. So we first comp compress this one so that what we fix now is the strain and we compress it and then we stop and we keep that deformation constant. What do you think is going to happen with stress? At the beginning, similar as before, if this is a linear viscoelastic solid, you won't may expect an increase of stress, a compression in this case, if you were to compress the solid. Uh, but uh, what's going to happen after this point, after we stop uh, adding strain? What is going to decrease? The stress will decrease over time. The, the stress will decrease over time. Can, can you see that? Can you kind of run that test um, in, your, in your mind. So, uh, and why? why? Why do you say why? why this? Well, first of all, we didn't answer why we have creep strains. We have creep strains because we have very small movements, say between sand grains or between salt grains, or you will have uh, small cracks that at, because of loading in the rock, they start to propagate, something that pr very likely you can't see but still it's going to happen inside the rock at some defects, at some very small pores, you're going to have some small cracking or some grain, grain sliding that is going to be a recoverable deformation. And because of that, at that constant stress, still you're going to have some deformation. In this case, uh, we have a stress applied on the solid, and if we fix the strain, still you're going to have some grain sliding, some cracking, but since you're not applying a constant stress, as soon as you cause that, uh, those micro failures, uh, the rock is going to get weaker in some sense, and this stress is going to decrease. And this is something called stress relaxation. 
and uh, it is it is very common in um, in salts as we were talking before uh, grain is sliding is very common in sands as well you may load the sand close to failure but after some time even if, if you keep that same strain the sand slowly is going to start to creep uh, grains are going to slide respect to each other and uh, the stress is going to go down that's a very important phenomenon for example in uh, defining horizontal stresses if if you have I'm drawing here a fault, okay? Uh, let's say that we have a truss fault of a sandy sediment, and because of very high tectonic strains coming in horizontal direction, uh, you cause a formation to, to have a fault. So this one is going to slide respect to each other. I don't remember we talked much about faults, but faults are just shear, shear fractures. Okay, so this is a shear fracture, and you may have caused at some time uh, with a tectonic strain, but if for some reason that tectonic strain stops and it, it doesn't uh, continue adding more strain, uh, the stress inside the sand, <coughs> while at the beginning it might have been very high because you were compressing this actively, after you stop compressing, uh, that stress is not going to stay like that forever. It's going to go down. It's going to decrease. And, uh, and you know, this kind of reminds me of that seminar that we had a few weeks ago about a presenter that was saying that near subduction zones, that where you have a lot of uh, compression strain, uh, they were finding very low stresses, low, uh, lower than vertical stresses. And I wonder if that's something related to, to this phenomenon. I'm not sure, OK? But what I'm sure about is that in many sandy reservoirs, if you uh, apply these equations of stress equilibrium due to uh, fault uh, at the limit of shear failure, your stress may be lower than that because the sand tends to relax uh, over time. Uh, the sun doesn't like to be stressed. And you have those small grains with a small possibility of sliding with respect to each other, they, they will do that. OK. And so we have creep, we have stress relaxation. And third, we have another phenomenon, which is uh, related to the rate of loading. Now let's say that we have a rock and we're going to load it as a function of time, similar to what we did before. And we're going to have two loading paths, one which is very fast and one which is uh, very slow. Let's assume for a moment that this is a, a dry rock. So we're not going to get into problems of of uh, undrain loading. Do you think the YAM modulus that we will measure for that, or the bulk modulus in this case, if we apply stress ramosa, is going to be the same? Let's make a YAM modulus this, instead of a bulk modulus. Just apply stress from one side. But it's the same thing, OK? Which one do you think is going to be, are they going to be different, or one is going to be higher than the other? So I'm running a, a compression experiment, and I want to measure what is the YAM modulus. If it, it's very similar to what we did before. It, if you uh, load the rock very slowly, you may let some of those fractures propagate with time. And as they propagate with time, they're going not to oppose the stress so quickly so that your YAM modulus it will tend to be lower than the YAM modulus that you will measure by uh, doing this uh, loading very quickly. Uh, so 
here we're going to apply a variation of strain that depends with time. It's the same thing with sands. Uh, for example, uh, you, you, can sand, you can load sands very quickly, and they will show a much higher yam modules than if you show them if you uh, load them very slowly, because if you load them very slowly, you're going to let some of those grains uh, move respect to each other, and that's going to allow for a, a lower yam modules. There's another phenomenon that is responsible for this. So, you know, we talked a lot about sands, uh, uh, grain scale phenomena of shear respect to each other, one grain moving to, the, to another. Uh, there is another concept that is also responsible for this called, we're not, we don't have time to go a lot through this, but if you're interested about this, there is something called Subcritical fracture propagation. I think we'll have time later on to come back into this topic. But basically, these subcritical fractures, they propagate at a velocity which is much slower than normal propagation of fractures. And that, the velocity of propagation depends on something which is called the stress intensity factor that we're going to see later on. But a uh, long story short, you're going to have fractures that propagate the velocity which is proportional to stress. So similar as you see over here, if uh, we, you load very slowly, uh, then you may let some of those fractures propagate and not to react against the strain that you're applying. On the other hand, if you do this loading very quickly, uh, your fractures may not have time to propagate as quickly as you're loading, and then you're going, just going to be loading a, a rock with, without any fractures uh, inside. Let me see if I'm forgetting anything over here. Mm. Oh, yes, one thing I'm forgetting. At the grain scale, there is not only grain uh, movement relative to each other, but if you put a lot of stress to, and is related to this phenomenon as well, you can have cracking and grain crashing at the contacts. So if uh, you let these fractures grow, similar to what we have over here, uh, your response is not going to be the same. And of course, if you have cracks, you have irreversible deformation that is going to be responsible for creep and stress relaxation. Are you guys familiar with salt domes or with salt diapirs? I see some people say yes, some people say no. So let's just try to find a cool picture about a salt diapir. It's related to viscoelasticity. So Okay, conceptually, this is a salt diapir. Uh, at the beginning, all this salt was sedimented just in one layer. And then when sediments come on top, they start to apply stress on this salt layer. And because salt has a less mass density than typical rocks, the salt may find an, in, an imperfection in here and just flow up like a fluid. But it takes thousands, uh, tens of thousands of years to develop such structures. Uh, even today, uh, especially near, the, near Houston and the, the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, you find many of these. Uh, th there is, at our time scale, there is nothing moving, but over geological time, these salt domes are rising. And they are rising because you have stress applied on it, they don't like shear stresses, and in order to avoid those shear stresses, they start, to they start to deform and to flow up. How fast they flow up depends on the viscoelastic properties. And for example, this, this is now a real, a real salt uh, diapir. So where uh, this, this is a seismic image, 
and those are uh, layers of sand and clay, and this is the salt uh, going up. There is, or there are, uh, I would say, well, I would say there is. There is the, the, the best team in the world studying this type of structures here in UT, in the Institute of Geophysics. And in order to explain this type of structures, uh, they use the constitutive models that we're going to talk about later on that invoke uh, plasticity. Uh, all right, so let's come back over here. Uh, all right, so th that's a very brief discussion of viscoelasticity, uh, a phenomenon that uh, you should take into account if uh, you have significant time-dependent deformation in, in rocks. Uh, any question about viscoelasticity uh, before I move on? Any example that you may want to share with everyone in here? No? I'm just trying to see if this is working. There's no red light in here, so I don't know if it's recording or not. It's just in the back. Uh, OK. Well, if not, let's move to the next, the next topic. Uh, I, I like, you know, but by now, we have done many things. So we have elasticity, and from there we went into poroelasticity. After poroelasticity, we talked about thermoelasticity. You can put this together, uh, and we just talk about visco elasticity and now we're going to talk about something that I call chemo elasticity so here we had changes of stress and strains because changes of pore pressure here we had changes of stress and strains because of changes of temperature and here we have time dependent changes of st stress and strain. With chemoelasticity, we're going to have stress and strains uh, which are caused by changes in the chemical potential of either the solid or the fluid. Uh, mostly it's going to be a change of some chemical composition in the fluid that causes a, a change in the solid structure. So this is going to affect the fluid, but the fluid is going to be intimately related to the solid uh, matrix. And if we wanted, for example, to write a, a full equation of a, of a thermoporo visco, or no, there's no reason to put a visco in a vis, viscous term, chemoelastic problem, then uh, we can have a relationship where stresses we know are a function of, uh, well, let me put total stresses now because we're going to put pore elasticity. Yes, Robert? Related to the heat energy, though? You, ca you can do that. Yes, you can do that. It's hard to measure. It's more like an abstraction, but yeah. but you, you could do that. And actually, the theory that the example I'm going to show in a bit it invokes some also Gibbs free energy. Uh huh. Yeah, 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 I think the, what, what you say is correct. And uh, um, I, I think we're going to get to an example today where, where we talked about that, and probably we can talk about uh, the Gibbs absorption isotherm, because it's going to be a problem about sorption. Uh, all right, so, so you know this here is effective stress. 
Uh, this one is the pore pressure correction term. Uh, but, but you can put all of these together. And here you could put also the, the change of temperature, and you can add as many things as you want. Okay? If you wanted to solve such a problem, uh, probably this is something, it, it's a fancy term nowadays uh, to solve something which are called THCM problems. And it's not only in the, in the geomechanics field, but also in material science and in many other applications, civil engineering, uh, you see that uh, this THCM problem. So what is that? So T stands for thermo, H stands for hydro, C stands for chemo, and M, have a favorite word for mechanical. So these are problems uh, called uh, multi-physics uh, problems in which you add many phenomena at the same time. And by adding uh, many of those phenomena at the same time, sometimes you can have things that you wouldn't have with a problem just on its own. Uh, for example, uh, ther for thermoelasticity, is, is, is very simple. Uh, thermoelasticity, uh, if you wouldn't have any displacement constraints, you can heat something up and, and, and then it, it will be free to dilate uh, and you may not be interested in the change of stresses, but if you were to fix this, the strains or fix the displacements as you heat it up, you will get a stress, something that you didn't have before uh, without considering the two of them together. And if you add two or three of these, you start to see some things, uh, some phenomenon that you wouldn't see uh, if you were not coupling those two at the same time. Yes, press them. Um, well, you're getting into the solution of the problem, right? Uh, you could do many types of, or you could choose many types of solutions for that. You can do iterative coupling, but conceptually we're just thinking about this problem as uh, a fully coupled as it is in reality. And you can also solve uh, these problems with uh, fully coupled uh, numerical uh, solutions. So uh, the combination of these type of problems is going to lead to something which is also a fancy word nowadays, which are it's called these emergent phenomena. These are uh, phenomena that you wouldn't get if you were not to combine uh, two or more of these processes together. Yes, Robert. Uh, yes, but this, this is just an abstraction, okay? This, this, I just, I, I want to write everything together. It's, so it's my not... Undergraduate my undergraduate degree is actually in chemical engineering. Yes. So I to recognize everything. That's okay, okay, okay. So probably then uh, you, you can correct some of the equations later <laughs> if, if you... I'll, I'll be happy to receive some feedback uh, about that. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't know much about chemistry, I have to be honest with you, so I just conceptualize it with uh, a chemical potential. But let's see now some real examples, okay, of what you could expect in, in uh, geomechanics applications of chemomechanical problems. There are several, and I forgot to say this, uh, there is one part which is chemoelasticity, uh, but there is another part of these problems that will go into something that we're going to see later on, and which is actually, it's not more interesting, but also has a lot of applications, which is, will be chemoplasticity, which will be to link plastic uh, irrecoverable deformations with chemical processing. Um, all right, so, okay, let's talk about examples of, of this chemoelasticity. Are you guys familiar with the concept of sensitive shales for drilling? Uh, 
You, you say yes, Amsa. Can, can you tell us what that is? And, and what is a different fluid? Uh, uh, like a different, salinity. different salinity, right? So well here, look, I'm making a plot of ionic strength, uh, which will be proportional to salinity. Um, shales, what, what are shales composed of? Mostly, mostly clays. Probably that, that's the, the key in shales that make them sensitive. And, and these clays uh, mostly are negatively charged on the surfaces and they are so small that the electrical properties at a very small scale, they start to take uh, a significant role on defining what is the equilibrium distance between these clay plate Platelets, platelets. So uh, if you have water over here, and uh, let's see, um, so the hydrogen is going to be the positive side, right? And the oxygen is going to be the negative side. Uh, so you will tend to have uh, closer to the surfaces the, the hydrogen atoms. But how far these uh, platelets are respect to each other depends on the ionic strength of this solution and how much uh, ions of, for example, if you have a sodium chloride solution, then we may have some of those uh, uh, sodium atoms that may go closer to the negatively charged surfaces and neutralize these uh, negatively charged surfaces. If you don't have that, uh, if you have a very low ionic concentration, you cannot neutralize a surface, and that's going to result in something which is called a separation between those clay layers and electrical repulsion that can be modeled with a theory which is called the double layer theory. So, but, you know, long story short, lots of ionic concentration make the equilibrium distance between the clay smaller. Small ionic concentration make the uh, equilibrium between the clay uh, layers larger. So, if we can see that now in here, by changing the ionic concentration, we can have something like this, a booklet of very close